So capitalism at first is an economic structure and mode of production of the civil society. That's basic common ground. And the German philosopher Max Horkheimer described the society building of the present as a skyscraper. On top, the managers of floor below are the important employees followed by uh, dozens of competing workers, professors, small businesses and farmers. Below them, there are lower minimum wage, lower and minimum wage workers, elderly people and sick and poor. Weaved into the fabric of the foundation are those poor souls working in misery so that we all can live in freedom. And as you can see in this image here, there's uh, the animals that are almost forgotten, but he describes them as being in the, uh, in the cellar, in the grounds, under the grounds and not noticeable for us humans. So there's something we have to do, and it is breaking into the cellar and opening up the doors. That's the basic principle of animal rights. And um, but let's go ahead with the description of uh, description of capitalism and how it came along. In the wealth of the nation, Adam Smith proclaimed that a invisible hand is regulating prices and profits on the free market. Free market with minimum legislative uh, boundaries. It drives maximum, maximum profit with the lowest effort. This means explo exploit nature to the maxim maximum workers' environment and animals are this nature to pro produce maximum profit for the capitalists while investing minimum time and monetary resources. That's maximizing profits in modern times. But then, in the last 100 plus years of capitalism, this system has expanded into a form of immense terror which produces more victims than beneficiaries. That's a quote from uh, the philosopher Jean Boutrilliat. But still, capitalism can be overcome because its dogma flowed into the smallest gap of the political agenda and the collective brain of our society. As you can see, modern democracy under capitalism is dictated by the necessity of growth and profit. Through reforms and massive lobbyism in the last decades, the so-called free market is hailed as the driver of wealth and progress. With the neoliberalism, our, soci our society seems more and more to lose grip of anything that is moral and driven by that is more and is only driven by greed. But maybe one objection is capitalism brought us wealth. Yeah, but this ignores the simple fact that it brought us wealth, but capitalism created disastrous conditions for billions of people, foremost in the global south, nature and environment, and often totally forgotten, that's why we're here, those forgotten ones the animals, non-human animals. And this was visualized in the foundation and the basement of the building from Max Horkheimer, the skyscraper. And this, this simply is the point why there can't be a capitalistic society without these elements that, drive, that thrive from exploitation of others, including around seven 70 billion land animals and an estimated one to three trillion, tr trillion, all right, it's, it's a high number of aquatic animals, only killed for the purpose of consumption. Yes. And with their suffering in mind, we cannot bluntly claim capitalism will cure our society from corruption and greed and violence. And it's even worse, in capitalism, our society produces, produces goods, for example, killing millions of animals just for the sake of profit, and might not even get these goods sold if not overtly advertised. So billions of animals 
are produced as waste. Concrete, we produce giant amount of harm in this system. That's what the picture is about, if you can see. But yeah, animal exploitation and capitalism. So we take a look in the history of where this come from, or this, this society comes from. At first, um, while aristocrats still ruled over most of Europe, wealthy English merchants and aristocrats in the 17th and 18th centuries began to force peasants off their land and privatize it. On the land, they created enclosed gaze, sheep gazes, grazes, to be part of the highly profitable wool or textile industry. This movement, this movement caused an even more tragic development uh, by, grow, by, the, by a growing population in Europe. Now, that's the quote that should be more on. So, men have been eaten by sheep, is the kind of uh, quote here. And yeah, so as millions of people were displaced from, the, from their pastures, a massive humanitarian crisis evolved, and so the state expanded into new frontiers. What you nowadays call USA or Canada was cleared from millions of inhabitants, both human and non-human animals. The Americas were the hunting grounds with their rich fauna, but in around 60 years, 60 years, the American bison was near extinction around 1890 to 19. The skulls of millions of bisons were used as fertilizer in the East, and of course, that was also a strategic goal of the U European immigrants to cut out this food source for the Native Americans. To import a European lifestyle later on in a massive import and massive import of hogs and cattle were shipped to Northern America. So they, they formed the former poor peasants could start all over again. And as ranches expanded even more into the lands of Native Americans who themselves were constantly displaced or killed, new slaughter facilities were built to keep up with the massive increasing numbers of animals. As production of meat grew and grew, meat was traded among the states and Europe, most, uh, mostly Great Britain, as described by Thomas, Tom, Tony Morrison in The Ghost of Slavery. The production of cotton and meat production were interlinked. Slavery in the South was dependent on the import of food, especially meat. Low soil fertility in the southern states made it nearly impossible to grow food crops. This led to starvation among slaves, as their food became cost of production of cotton. But for the still growing population, new methods for production were needed. Like here, this is a disassembly line. You can go picture for picture. It's an illustration. The division of labor grew revolutionary potentials in the era of industrialization. Manufacturing is divided into simple parts to produce semi-finished products that move from workstation to workstation until a final product is assembled. Many believe that Henry Ford was the one to introduce this type of manufacturing process into the USA, but he often wrote about how he perfectionized assembly lines or disassembly lines of the meatpacking industry in the Chicago stockyards. The slaughterhouse and meatpacking workers who often were non-English speaking immigrants didn't, did not need to be specialized to work in the so-called Chicago Union stockyards. Sadly, their bosses knew that very well and treated them like parts of a machine that were easily replaced when injured in the facilities. And of course, there is no question how horrific how horrific other animals were treated throughout the whole process. The author Upton Sinclair himself worked incognito in the Chicago stockyards for several weeks and wrote a groundbreaking book called The Jungle. 
the vegetarian or vegan Sinclair wrote explicitly about the suffering of animals, tragic conditions of workers in the meatpacking industry, that they had nearly no rights, including no sick leave pay, of course, no minimum wage, and sickening housing conditions worsened through the real estate businesses and how greed, empowered by capitalism, was the hidden view of this whole jungle. After publishing his book in 1906, 1906, there was a public uproar worldwide. But, that's a quote from him, but the laws that introduced were only about more hygiene and inspections slightly improved working conditions, and nearly no animal welfare. But yeah, that was a long time ago. And how do we today abuse animals? Well, we live in the same system. And there might not be the need to explain that we still use and abuse animals in different ways. It might be not too far off to say today we are killing more animals for food and clothing and entertainment, etc., than ever before. Yet, however, it is much more unnecessary, unnecessary as it might be some 500 years ago. Still, we do. And there's also, uh, by the way, this is a picture of a uh, uh, meatpacking uh, facility from 2005. In I think Michigan. So we're consuming more animals than ever. And this is worldwide. And also there is the dilemma of the slaughterhouse workers. As studies from slaughterhouse workers and numerous interviews suggest, those people do their job because they believe their work is necessary and truly think that otherwise we would need to have would need to eat grass and flowers. And in fact, they need to sell their labor in order to provide or survive with their families and only the least necessary, and that's only the least necessary. They don't enjoy killing animals. And even though they don't know, they know that they seem to be part of a much bigger tragedy, workers are what Marxists call alienated from their product of labor. Only a few get to look animals in the eye. Most of these workers only work with body parts that have already lost their identity by running through a manufacturing process. Even, even in the most modern meat packing plants, workers are forced to do 40,000 to 100,000 motions per shift, so eight to 10 hours including slicing, lifting, and tossing animal parts. This high frequency in the meatpacking industry produces workers, produces workers that commonly suffer from diseases due to the high pressure on muscles and joints. Most of these people can only work for several months or years in these facilities before they are out of physical or psychological power. So, workers get exploited, animals pay for the, with their lives, but who profits? Uh, yeah, I think in a way, animal exploitation today is a very good example, good example, horrifying example instead uh, of how capitalism works. So I used some tiny illustrations to show you this. Um, we've got the capitalist or entrepreneurs, if you want, uh, that own the means of productions. So animals, meatpacking plants, trading routes, etc. We've got the workers that have to sell their labors in order to survive because they got nothing else to give. And we've got animals that are part of the nature, of the nature, produced nature maybe, but in this case, a feeling and an autonomous individual that gets oppressed and as a resource and a, uh, is part of a production process. 
well, capitalists, entrepreneurs, whatever, employ these workers at a minimum cost, take and buy whatever resources, resources such as animals, also at a minimum cost to manufacture other goods in their, in their own facilities, also at a minimum cost, and sell them with a the maximum profit. So these numbers of sold products for animals, for animal products, uh, slaughtered animals, however you want to put it, has to e increase each year as capitalism itself puts on the infinite growth. So there has to be growth. Costs related to the destruction of nature or workers, if you want to, are not what are put in the calculations of these profiteers. But we all, the societies, have to pay the bills, such as deforestation, extinction of insects, health problems, climate change, and climate refugees, and many more. In the modern animal agriculture, maximum profit can only be achieved by keeping costs for animals, including the upbringing, and wages for the workers, all at the bare minimum. Yeah, and that's how <laughs> the capitalists, of course, destroy our planet. Of course, this might be just a little illustration and it might be a bit of funny, maybe not. And it's, it's still just how the system works. That doesn't mean one person owns everything, okay? Just an illustration. But yeah, let's go to uh, why the system is like that. And why we all have to to pay the prices of this mass destruction of nature, animals, and humans, of course. Uh, yeah. I've got some examples for you. One example is the shredding of chicks, so the killing of male animals in the egg, facility, egg or hatching facilities. Um, we all know that there are chicks that get shredded or gassed alive because they are of a male gender, so they won't produce enough eggs. No, they won't produce any eggs, yeah. But, um, yeah, there cannot be any doubt it's unnecessary suffering and killing of an animal. And under the law of the German uh, animal rights law, or animal welfare law, it is, it should be illegal. But the strife for profit overrules these animal welfare laws. And even if protests in uh, Germany seemed very effective on a political level, the killing of around 50 million chicks is still in practice a year, 50 million chicks a year. And uh, it's the only way to produce economically, at least if we believe all those businesses. And yeah, our uh, Minister of uh, Agriculture said that he will expect the industry to shift to uh, another form. That was in two March 2016. And in January 2017, he said, Germany has solved the ethical problem of the shredding with this technology. So that was 2017. And still, there are 1.6 million more chicks grinded. So how could this be? As long as breeding and shredding or gassing chicks are, is a guarantee for profits than on any other method, the killing will remain. And another example. The European Union subsidizes 318 billion euros for agricultural production. This includes 3.4 billion euros only for the support of export of products. This 
therefore is a double punch in the face of the people who, is suffering, who are suffering from climate change and cheap imports of goods that destroy national market spheres, especially in the global, global south. The EU ex supports these massive investments as guarantees for growth and expansion. But growth as a factor of success is detrimental because eventually everything has that counts on growth for success will grow out of bounds, just like cancer. And there's another example. As noted, the cost for destruction of our habitats through deforestation of monocultures that kill insects like bumblebees are not paid by the profiteers themselves, but by the global societies. For example, a giant seed corporation has been sold to a German-based firm. This is the same corporation that deals with pesticides that are at least partly to blame for the massive loss of wildlife, including wild bees, that are far more productive than invading bees of hobby or industrial beekeepers. Yet, pesticides still are allowed. And now we come into a part that's a bit difficult because I'm also a part of it in some in somehow. Yeah. So this is the part of critique of action within the animal rights and animal welfare movement. It doesn't mean that everything is shit. It's just I want to say some things about it. The term late capitalism describes a period from 1945, when we seem already to feel the harms of this economic system itself on our lives, for example, climate change. But also, we feel this crapping system is kept alive with artificial help. As institutions like the World Trade Union got more and more influence in the, political, uh, in the politics of governments, they also prescribe the way in which our society is built and organized. This includes massive substitutions for an ineffective or harmful processes and exploitation of people living already precarious lives. German philosopher Herbert Marcuse um, criticized this consumerism, which su suggests that the current system is one that claims to be democratic, but is author authoritarian in character, as only a few individuals dictate the perception of freedom by only allowing certain choices of happiness to be available for purchase. He further, further suggests that the modern conception that happiness can be bought is one that is psychologically damaging. Maybe I've got a quote from here. Oh, yeah. So if you want to read it, you can read it, but I will try to go on. Or you can look on YouTube. All right. And we cannot live without food. That's a fact, and we can't ignore it. But our need for food is not why corporations produce goods, because that would mean that there would be no waste, no unnecessary luxury products like calf meat or foie gras. They simply produce because they expect profits. And to generate an artificial demand for the goods, corporations make effective use of propaganda, like this one here. In the past, public, uh, the public has invested billions into the meat, egg, and dairy industry. They will not fall short of capital to invest in advertisement or lobbyism to follow their cruel agenda within the next years or decades. Furthermore, there is a general focus on lifestyle veganism, which include, excludes any deeper or even political message. Moral doesn't sell that easy as it seems. The whole consumerist ide ideology, however, <laughs> is based upon the false belief that everything is possible if we just buy it, build it, or consume it. Corporations and society makes us to accept that only this magic bullet, this one magic bullet, will heal all our needs. 
But how can things make us happy, healthy, and satisfied if everything around us goes to pieces? Yeah. Just like poverty, speciesism, and oppression is not a natural phenomenon. It's made. And by not at least mentioning the causes and the inherent problems of our consumerist society, we are playing a game without a joystick. Yeah. Skip a part. Let's go to another part. Corporate campaigns. Please change. NGO in the animal welfare sector invest massive time and money in demanding more vegan options from companies. Soft tones are commonly used when talking to big animal businesses. It's common not to pressure those corporations. Maybe they can be helpful later on, maybe donations, advertisements, I don't know. They predict maximizing profits and growth by introducing vegan alternatives. So the NGO to corporations. To round up the new deals and show support, they provide the means to advertise in the name of the NGO. So the new vegan ice creams is in store in July 2018, whatever. But guess who will buy the stuff first. Yes, it's the vegans. Therefore, organizations who debate with corporations invest even more effort to get questionable businesses to sell their goods. It's free advertisements on cost of honorable donations for the just the tiny chance of a new rice milk or some new chips. Vegan chips, of course. Well, not only is this approach damaging on a, these specific levels by demanding the least, all within the, in the economic range that's acceptable for those corporations, there is nearly no progression. Reva, R -E -V -E, uh, w -E, one of the biggest supermarket chains in Germany, proclaimed that their producers will stop beak trimming, so cutting up the noses of the hands, uh, chickens, by 2017. Indeed, they did, but without any improvement for the chickens. But the announcement itself was boldly promoted as a victory by many animal welfare organizations in 2016 and 2017. Just as a reminder, without being a fact and without being any good for the suffering individuals, more precisely, it's gotten worse for the chickens. So that was free greenwashing and advertisements for Germany's big, biggest animal exploiters by nonprofits. Yeah, hooray. But okay. There's another thing. It's called co optation. This co optation is caused when nonprofits negotiate with corporations in general. And as it seems, this fact is fatally ignored within the animal welfare sphere. But it has to be clear that when demanding change from corporations, there is only one profiteer with the upper hand who controls the outcome, the businesses in question. By using the label, prestige, and channels of the nonprofit, businesses can raise profits and wash themselves clean of any harm previously made. In this scenario, suppliers have to frame themselves as a positive influence with framing themselves as the pragmatics and denouncing more progressive and radical NGO as extremists, not worth a debate. It therefore seems like the negotiating business and the NGO have one thing in common, silencing the radicals. But yeah. That's not how this game should work. Another dimension of silencing the radicals is when negotiating within the movement for the best strategies, we commonly feel progressive ideas by nonconformists are rejected at first sight. There's always a affirmative character to the status quo. Gentle gestures towards people and corporations seem to be the way we roll. But how can we overcome the domination over other animals by and killing of this planet by confirming 
the very ideas of this that keep this wheel rolling. Pressure campaigns against corporations? No, because we still live in capitalist society. That will never change. Yeah, that's the problem. Try new ways to educate young people uh, only within the school system because they know that, right? Yeah, yeah, they know it, right? How can we achieve something, anything, by not demanding it directly? That's my question. And yeah, oh, I jumped this pretty picture. Um, that's usually how I feel negotiating uh, is within some uh, spheres. Yeah, of course, it's a bit harsh. Yeah, um, but let's go to the next point. Um, let's call it positivism. That's a term that. Uh, yeah, gives all hail to the data. Yes, we are people who care for animals, including humans, environment and working conditions. It's necessary to stick to important data. But this leaves the biased introduction to this data completely out of equation. Questionnaires and statistics are always designed with a vague goal in mind. That might not be as bad as it sounds, but it becomes problematic when the same collected data becomes a partly official narrative, narrative and called objective data, data. And this becomes even more tragic when opposite and alternative ideas are completely ignored. This is what we see in the material children get in uh, schools for study. So these textbooks, uh, uh, yeah, only suggest the very all well known uh, neoliberal research from economics, but ignore every other aspect like anarchism or communism that would be maybe a good idea. But I won't. Oh, yes. oh, so I have to go on a little further. But yeah, this example just uh, should outline how deeply we are all indoctrinated within uh, this upbringing we all have. And that might not always be bad, but we need to keep a critical mindset up to date and question every worldview. To bring this in context to the animal welfare movement, some NGO in our movement pretend to be most effective and reach out to millions of people, but they are most quiet about how many people react on their activism. 200,000 newsletter subscribers, 300,000 leaflets, or 1 million Facebook fans, it's the only thing we know for sure, but their impact is doubtful. And this brings me to this one. The average open rate in email marketing for all industries we analyzed is 20.81%. That's from uh, MailChimp. That's one of the biggest uh, yeah, email marketing systems. And the click rates are even lower. They're at 2.443. And of those 2.43, clicked, some folks are heading directly to the unsubscribe button. For Facebook ads or videos, the st statistics are even more devastating and disillusioning. The average advertisement on this platform has so-called click-through rates, so landing on a page, and that you want your audience to go off 0 0.92. But there is an organization called the Animal Charity Evaluators, ACE, that state to be the, the ones who know to be mo how to know to know how to be most effective in our activism. To do so, they collect data from different sources, including including the very charities they evaluate, and latter put them into nice clickable top charity lists where everyone seems to get a glimpse of how effective an organization is and 
to which one of you should donate your money to help their work to continue. Of course, not. this is a very problem. It's uh, the perception of this. To make it to the extreme, ACE is an organization that lacks fundamental knowledge in criti critical and effective campaigning, pressuring corporations or media advertising. Also, they rely on studies or interviews ACE receives from animal welfare charities they pretend to benchmark themselves. So I'm sorry to say, but that's a bit problematic. Because of this behavior, a whole movement seems to go ahead with these polished numbers and repeat false messages. Within this current economic system, we cannot save any animal by just switching to meatless Mondays or go vegan in, in January. And this brings me to another point, the foot-in-the-door technique. Of course, it's easier for most people to follow a common narrative and ideology. Social desirability is real, but it also can be changed over time. To illustrate this, just remember how women's rights campaigns worked or the LGBTQ movement. They all started from a very unpopular position. But sadly, this is not an easy way to go. Barricades are everywhere and humans will come into your way when defending other animals' rights to be free from harm and domination. It demands a lot of resources, strength, and long breath to keep your head up in this endless seeming fight. But modern NGO are not dumb and know an easier way. Present a cheap trick and slowly demand more. This is often called the foot in the door technique and commonly used by popular animal welfare organizations around the globe. Vegan, veganuary, Meatless Monday or Vegan Pledge are famous campaigns to get those omnivores folks out there to become a fellow vegan. This compliance strategy is also commonly used by, who'd expect it, businesses to sell their products to people that don't even want them. Extracting demand is a phrase used by sales women, men, make up a framing in which the product fits. It might be shocking for some, but there is an even more effective, effective and desirable technique to get people to think more about animals. The foot-in-the-door technique, the foot-in-the-face technique or the door-in-the-face technique, some call it. By demanding a very radical, large leap at first, we can expect a heart full compliance for smaller requests. So an alternative postulated by Dolinsky is the foot in the face technique. The compliance is greater when a second request is made immediately after the first is rejected. But after a time lapse of two or three days is the first if the first request is accepted. Researchers found that between 63 and 68 compliance rates when using the foot in the face technique, while traditional techniques showed lower rates around 50%. Of course, these are just numbers that one statistic showed, so I don't care what I say, just prove it for yourself. This doesn't mean I support any strategy that is based on selling shit to others. It's just an indicator to question the things you've been told by modern strategists. And I had a point about uh, clean meat, but I skipped that because of time and stuff. Uh, but you can read it on my website. So would be nice, but yeah. Maybe we can talk around uh, that later on. So animal welfare is also a part that uh, gives me grinches and uh, yeah, because we exploit animals not because we think they're inferior, we think they're inferior because we exploit them. That's a well-known phrase now, maybe. 
But animal welfare is not an unpleasant duty, but an economic necessity. And this comes from a meat producer. Of course, we can use that and tell them, yeah, so do something about animal welfare. But no, that will help them to increase their profits and to increase the killing of animals, just in more humane ways. Well, if we look at Upton Sinclair himself, a vegetarian or vegan, described the horrific, horrifying conditions of the Chicago meatpacking industry after being called a muckraker, his book changed something. Hygiene was improved, pace increased a bit, but the lives of the animals were untouched. With this in mind, we can see how our desire to change things sometimes become torpedoed by lawmakers or strong opposition maybe by both. And sure, this puts activists into a sad position. Where's the chance that we win within this world? This seems like the call for animal welfare, get some things better now instead of waiting. Yeah, but let's know where animal welfare came from and why. Until today, animal welfare uh, was and is always just a matter of securing profits, rentability, through making it humane or more acceptable with perfection of product, production processes. So anesthesia, reduction of stress because of taste problems, not because of animal, uh, animal welfare problems. The products of animals are more likely to succeed on the market with animal welfare in it. There's no humane way to raise, abuse and slaughter animals. No bigger cage will fit their needs. No live transport will make them happier before their slaughter. But, uh, but the thing animal welfareists have in mind is simple. Social desirability to keep funding and their employee, for their employees and campaigns. Which is not bad at, at first. And we could separate those animal welfare-oriented organizations from the actual animal rights organizations and let them do their thing, their welfareism. But that's sadly not what big groups intend to do. They jump on the low-effort, high-impact paradigm train and pretend to be saviors for the animals and in the here and now. But this is a very problematic and monothematic way of looking at things. NGOs working with lawmakers to improve conditions in which animals are raised and slaughtered gives a green light to people who at least had concerns consuming or using animal products. The shiny animal welfare approved label couldn't be more acceptable by this meat-eating society. And on top of that, with every improved law, that very law is like a handbook on how animals could be used. Upton Sinclair got a glimpse of how new laws only manifest the abuse of animals and workers in Chicago by polishing the semantics. Last but not least, important is the threat of the logic of capitalism to find much more cruel ways to exploit. Banning a certain type of industry standard will ultimately end up by making the former lost profit in another sector. So, organic meat was promoted as a more humane way to kill animals and is one of the biggest growing sectors of animal exploitation today. No animal will be happier if he or she is still trapped inside a cage to get killed without willing to die. There is nothing more effective for all people who care for animals than demanding the total abolition, abolition of animal oppression. So maybe it's, it's kind of late, so I skip uh, two, two examples I have and go to a, maybe a more positive thing here. Yeah, we could do progressive campaigns. I hope it's clear that there won't be a way to liberation without demanding dismantling capitalism. There won't be an easy way. We don't need to go that way with corporations that profited from of capitalism exploitation of workers and animals. In this society, it's 
it's our duty to fight these corporations that not only destroy our planet but kill billions of animals, not only to massive, massively decrease their impact into our daily lives, but because they won't give us liberation just because they want to. Therefore, a goal should be not to have more vegan options, but to continue campaigning against these corporations. Only with a constant pressure, we can build a moral obligation to change corporations or even destroy their destructive business affairs. It could also be very plausible and impactful to unite with other movements that aim at social justice, environmental or other leftist ideas. But please don't go hand in hand with anyone that's uh, right winged, all right? Be radical, like Emma Goldman. Um, yeah, I've got two quotes here, but I think that I will skip them. We're going away no one walked before. If we demand radical change in case of animal rights, we expect people to react with shyness or skepticism. But there is a great chance to encourage organizations, people and politicians to walk a new path, a new path far away from the status quo. We are always living under the impression that we don't need to do something extreme. But in order to move forward to total liberation, we need to realize that there is a need for a very extreme action. One very important thing about cap capitalism is that there can't be an easy way out. There has to be a massive uproar and fight for the right thing to happen. No cuddling with corporations, or realistic negotiations, as some call it, would have suspended child labor. And don't let us be fooled by long-distance promises. The logic of capitalism and its drive for maximum profits and endless growth makes it necessary to find alternatives to profit-decreasing interventions. As time passes by, advantages will be destroyed by the same logic. The faster and more radical we act in our campaigns, the better are the chances to succeed and make positive impact for everyone. Sorry for the total disillusion. As soon as one fight is over, another has to start. For example, it took over 10 years to implement an eight-hour workday in Germany. After those years, capitalism has already found a way to increase productivity. Therefore, the benefits for the workers were already blown, blown out as the law for an eight-hour workday was active. It could be a simple phrase like, if you eat animals, you are an asshole. Just try it like that. And another form I think that could be very helpful. We can focus on education. If you focus on our future generations, we can build up a more anti-specist way of thinking about animals. That's nothing simple and it won't be easy, but there's plenty of forms of interventions to educate others. For example, we can make films, screenplays, so scripted films, movies, <laughs> and uh, documentations, report, reports, whatever, videos, explanation videos, short excerpts of movies, mixed media sites, leaflets, whatever, you can read it and you can surely find another very interesting ideas. And yeah, there are other promising opportunities. Can promote local and organic foods, we, because that's the only way we can, yeah, secure this planet maybe. And uh, what I like to do is to support worker-owned collectives, so corporations that don't uh, drive from a higher group or hierarchy uh, and get there. And please don't fall for any heroes. Everyone that's a hero or gets a heroic status will fall. So you will fall with them. And, oh, thank you. 
And yeah, let's learn from others, the ones that did something. There's uh, Shaq, there's um, my group, Tifa Prigen Widerstand, that's uh, focused on uh, new upcoming um, uh, slaughterhouses and maybe it just opens a browser and stuff. And um, yeah, the Food Empowerment Project, Black Vegans Rock, the divestment movement, and uh, yeah, I think there's plenty of room to go. And yeah, I'm I run out of time like ten minutes ago, but yeah. So thank you very much. Thanks for watching my talk. And yeah, what do you think? Should we focus on education or should we focus on pressuring campaigns against corporations? Just comment below and yeah, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and go ahead to total liberation. <laughs>